Okay. All right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Very excited to be here with Helen Keplinger. Um, and thanks to everyone at home joining on a Friday night. Um, thank goodness it's Friday, although Fridays tend to seem like any other day of the week now that uh, you know it's a little bit of a, a different a different day to day. But still, it's Friday, so we're going to pour some wine. Um, we're going to talk to Helen Keplinger. We'll just give a couple minutes for people to join from home. Um, but while we're waiting, I thought I would pour some wine. So I have the uh, 2016 Vermilion. Awesome. Red wine, which I love. What are you drinking, Helen? Uh, you know, I just put the bottle back in the bed fridge, but it's the 2006 Sabine Gatme uh, Champagne, just a tiny yeah. producer we discovered in Champagne when we were there in August. And we just bought three cases and had them shipped over. <laughs> so I think we're down to this is maybe the last bottle. But wow. Well, yeah. thank you for sharing it with us, sort yeah, of, cheers. virtually, yeah. your last bottle. <laughs> but cheers. Thank you for joining us. So excited to have you here. Um, so I think we can probably get started. Um, for anyone who's just joined, um, my name is Vanessa Conlin. I'm the head of wine for Wine Access. I'm here with winemaker um, Helen Keplinger, who also is my friend. Um, and my former neighbor, I used to live uh, about, what, three houses down from you, Helen? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, I miss that because they have chickens. And so I used to chicken sit sometimes and, um, and get, get the free eggs. So <laughs> <laughs> it's actually handy right now since there are no eggs in the supermarket. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. Well, um, it's great to have you here. Thank you. And, um, and for any of you watching at home, we'll be taking your questions, so please um, type them in the chat and we'll answer them before the end of the, the half hour. But um, I wanted to start by asking a question. Um, a lot of people uh, in the wine business had either um, you know, an education in a different field or actually a whole other career in a different field before they got into wine. So I was wondering if you could tell us did you have another interest um, that you were pursuing before you got bitten with the, the passion for winemaking? Yeah, before I was, um, before I decided to go into winemaking, I thought I would become, I was sort of on this track to become uh, a doctor and uh, to go into medicine. And I was always interested in science and um, travel and food and art and being outdoors and but I was really I, I thought that the sciences were really interesting and challenging and so that's what I was pursuing but um, do you want that whole story because that's, that's that could be a long one <laughs> I'll try to give us the highlights <laughs> my parents were huge foodies back before there was even a term and so um, we grew up with my mom making everything from scratch my dad had a wine cellar and they drank wine every night and they still do. In fact, there was never even water on the table for them. They just drank wine. Um, so, um, so that was kind of the, the upbringing and, um, and, but I just never thought of it as a career because I grew up in Ohio. And then when I went to undergrad, I focused on science, as I said, and I sort of moved through different fields and then landed on medicine. And then um, I went and did uh, medical research and I didn't love the day to day, but I love the people I worked with. And so I took off and did some traveling and in the traveling, um, I noticed that I really loved wine and missed it because I was in Southeast Asia and I was a volunteer making, I don't know, $25 a month or something like that. So I didn't really have a wine budget. And there wasn't much wine to be found. Um, and so I, um, I came back and uh, was working on my med school applications, but I was also taking a care of a friend's Arabian horses in Western Massachusetts and working in an outdoor store and then um, and also working in the clinic with the shadowing the academics who I'd done research with. And so when I was taking care of the horses, I had these big gaps of time where I would read and um, I found people has such an awesome um, 
library, I just read a lot of books, and one of the books was really, which was the story of Philippe de Rothschild. So it was his autobiography, and it was a lot of, it resonated because it was Philippe in his 20s. He was totally soul searching, trying to figure out what he wanted to do, and his family, was, they were all in banking, and he didn't want to pursue banking. And it just, you know, it was sort of the this, you know, when I was doing medical research, I loved science, but I didn't love the day to day and I didn't feel great about, I didn't think I was the most amazing lab tech in the world because I just wasn't that engaged. And then when I was in Thailand, I lived in Thailand for a year after that and I was doing research, I was doing uh, volunteering and I was a teacher and, um, you know, I just, I, I liked teaching, but God, I had to work so hard at teaching to be decent. And so I just thought, gosh, I just don't, you know, I want to find something that I love. And that, um, not that work is effortless, but that something that every day I'm going to love getting up in the morning and be super engaged and super dedicated and charged. And when I read the story of the Lady Vine, at that point I was living in Boston and I would um, I would go to Western Mass, which is this great wine retailer, and I would buy um, a case at a time, feed, and then I would go back and stock up. And so it just kind of clicked that, you know, this combined the science did my for thing I love artists. Um, I love wine and it just seems so far fetched, but I gave up on medical applied to UC for the graduate program. And I left Boston and traveled for California. At first I thought I'd made a huge mistake, <laughs> but um but I love it. I still love it. I love what I do. I love one kind of people and I love growing and I love that everyone is I love that wine and I have to work cool and I like that they make your spirit better that I trust. They're just part of such a really rich kind of uh, care of your your Long answer. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I it cut out just a little bit, but um, but I I did get that. You know, you followed your dream, and and this is something that that you love doing, and um, I feel the same. You know, I I I work really hard, but I I, I can't imagine doing anything else. I absolutely love I absolutely love like working in wine. Um, so sort of a, a follow-up question is um, you took the helm of Grace family um, in the last couple of years, right? Um, Grace is one of the, or I think was kind of considered the first real cult winery uh, in Napa. And so I was wondering, what does it feel like to take over something so iconic uh and is there sort of a sense of pressure in having uh you know having that brand at your fingertips um that's a lot of questions <laughs> uh, i you know i always i met um okay so when i was in thailand i um i was there for a year and then at the end of the year i went to nepal and wanted to do a trek in the Everest region. So we were there for, I was there with a couple other volunteers who were friends and we, we spent three weeks and we went up to the Everest region and um, somewhere along our, you know, meandering and hiking, trekking, uh, we stopped at the highest bakery in the world to have coffee before our day of walking and, you know, getting further into the wilderness. And who should be there but Dick Grace. And this was part of my figuring out that I really wanted to be a winemaker because I hadn't had wine for a year. And um, when I saw him, I knew who great what Grace was. But I, was I was a volunteer and before that I was doing medical research. So it's not like I had a big wine budget. So I'd never purchased or drank a bottle of grape. But he had one bottle and I, I took the bottle and was just like, oh my God, wine. And so, um, and, Grace, and so that was really crazy. And and, um, and then fast forward, uh, fast forward maybe, I don't know, six years later, I was working with Heidi Barrett and I went to go see her one day. She would go to eight 
wineries. He was up in Grace, and um, he and so I got to see Grace and meet Dick again. And then um, back in 2014, I always thought of Grace, at least about the winery. I love the history, I love the heritage, I love the wines, so beautiful and kind of maintains the course, but, but then started to feel like they were getting collected for a while. And so it was just a place that was always in the back of my head as something that was so special and would be such, um, such an honor to work with them and kind of help get them back to where they had been. And so in 2014, um, I got a call to go interview with Dick Grace and I wasn't really looking for anything at that point. Um, but when I got the call, I said, for sure, I would be interested. I went up and I met Dick and it was completely organic. <clears throat> and he didn't remember me at all. <laughs> so, but we had this great interview and, um, and, you know, I, I bumped into him a couple times and, and occasionally, and it was sort of at maybe five to eight year intervals. And he never remembered me. He meets a lot of people. And, yeah. um, and the same thing, I, you know, I said, do you remember when we met? And I told him the story. He laughed so hard. And, um, and I left. And then he called me 15 minutes later and offered me the job. So um, it was... Wow. It was Working there, it has been great working there. It was great working with Dick because he had made the decision to really reinvest in the property and the wine and making it really special and great again. And so we made a lot of investments in um, farming, the winery, um, just really his son was managing the property and he's incredibly bright and talented and farms organically. And he's so awesome, but he was just getting really busy with stag's leap and he needed some some help and so we hired Kendall Smith and it's just it's been really awesome to to really breathe life into a project like that again so and yeah for sure every year I think I hope I'm honoring what they've had and not taking it and completely changing it you know it's sort of trying to be respectful of the heritage but also trying to make it the best it could possibly be so yeah fun challenging yeah Wow. Well, I'm going to pour a glass of the Carte Blanche 2015, the proprietary red. Um, and so, which kind of leads me to my next question. So I know obviously we're, we're here in Napa, you work a lot with Bordeaux varieties here, but I know you also under um, your own eponymous label, Keplinger, um, have a real love for Rhone varieties. So I'm curious about how you approach winemaking differently with the Rhone varieties versus the Bordeaux varieties. Yeah, I, yeah, that's lucky. With Carte Blanche, I actually get to, um, I get to make uh, Chardonnay and Pinot too. And so for each, for each varietal and each wine, wine style, I guess, that, that those varietals make, I try to think about, um, I really try to think about what makes, you know, what makes uh, really incredible Grenache um, so special, what makes it different and what makes Grenache as a plant tick. Because farming, it's really different from farming Cabernet. Cabernet is actually pretty easy to farm. And I think about that with um, with all of the varietals and I think about it in terms of canopy management and crop load, for sure pick decision. And then what I wanna do with it in the wine cellar um, with wine making and um, how much load and elevage, all of it. Um, so I just, they're all different. And to me, I love, I love the wines of the Rhone. I love that they're kind of wound up and backwards. Uh, Grenache in particular is really um, susceptible to oxidation. And uh, I think if you protect it and kind of keep it wound up, it's got great evolution, both in the glass and in the bottle of her aging. And I, Syrah for me is the same way. I, really, I like it when it starts out backwards. And I guess that's a commonality because I like that with uh, white burgundy, how you get matched to production and, and you have a wine that's really, really wound up. And if you have a wine like that, you know that it's going to open and you've got a long evolution for aging and for drinking and just seeing how it changes in the glass. And that's what I really enjoy. So I don't know if I answered that question, but I do think about every, I do think about each varietal and wine differently and, and the vineyards are also different as well. So. 
So um, I know that you also, you, you work with vineyards outside of, of, of Napa Valley. So what, I mean, do you, what drew you to those different vineyard sites and like what excites you about, about those? Uh, what first drew me there was um, in, for, in 2006, I was looking for Grenache for my own label. And I just happened to be uh, catching up with Andy Erickson um, who he's a good friend. We were at grad school together and we were just catching up and he said, what are you up to? And I said, I'm starting my own label. I'm going to be doing Grenache because I'd made wine for three years in the pre rot And I just totally was captivated by how Grenache was so different in very different vineyards, you know, and especially in the pre rot because all of the soil is essentially the same. And so to see, you know, basically the same soil types with different aspects, humidities, uh, slopes, uh, elevations that they all produce very very different wines it just i thought it was incredible and so i came back pretty obsessed with grenache but in 2005 there wasn't a lot of grenache in northern california and so he introduced me to ann kramer who's up in uh, Sutter creek in amador county and at that point there wasn't there was a whole lot going on in the foothills um it's been a quiet region. I think a lot of the people who are out there like it that way. And, um, you know, they get to do their own thing. And Anne had farmed in Napa for 25 years and went out there because her family had owned an orange orchard in Southern California, a citrus orchard. And they sold the orchard and then they reinvested the money in this beautiful, you know, I forget how big her property is. I think it's maybe 80 acres. And um, so she planted it. And I met her and I didn't think that I wasn't really looking for the foothills, but when I met her, she's absolutely brilliant. She has so much energy and passion and her soils were unbelievable. And it's the kind of vineyard where you drive to the front gate and just seeing the vineyard, you can tell how well it's farmed. I mean, it's so beautiful and it's not perfect. I don't think the vineyards in, in the foothills are perfect the way they're, they're manicured elsewhere. Um, there's definitely a wildness to them, but it was so cap it was so appealing. And so um, when I started working with Anne and just driving around out there, the soils unreal. They're just bright red volcanics and rocky and granite outcroppings, and there's just so much that's so um, exciting for soil. And I used to feel that way when I drove around the pre route because there's so much rock. You can look out and see old Roman, you know, terraces that used to have grapevines. I mean, it's just, it's such a breathtaking landscape. And as a winemaker, I mean, it was in a, when I was a kid, I always collected rocks. So I always had a love of geology and kind of ties up wine really well. So I get really excited when I see vineyards that have particular rock combinations or slope or, so that's basically what drew me there. And then meeting, um, meeting farmers who were super dedicated to farming for really high quality wines and who were willing to try new things. Or, you know, when I said, when I asked them to drop a lot of crop or, you know, do something in the vineyard, they were happy to work with me. And do it. So that's, that's what happened. So you, you began to answer my next question, which was, um, how involved are you actually in the vineyards? um versus obviously we know you're making the wine but are you involved every step of the way in in terms of the the viticulture as well or you kind of come in closer to harvest no we we talk a lot during the year um i i like to work i think all of my growers are i have pretty good relationships with everybody and um we talk throughout the year i think the winter is a little bit quiet but it starts up now i mean just Today, I was talking to Phil Katuri, who's one of our growers, and, and he's absolutely brilliant and awesome to work with. But I like that close interaction, and I think the, the farming is it's absolutely integral to the kind of wine any winemaker wants to make. And I love the, I love the vineyard. I love you know, the cover crops and what the cover crops do. I love thinking about the microbiome out there. I love um, the just absolutely everything about it, the canopy management, the crop, um, how much crop is on, irrigation, just thinking about all of those inputs that um, that can make a wine better. And and they also, so what I usually do is I start in, um, 
May or June, and I go every, I go to the vineyards every week or two weeks, and I keep a notebook, and I write notes on every block, because you can see variation, you can see problem corners, and if there's a vineyard manager who might be managing a big area, my rows might need something different, and nobody knows my rows better than I do, because I just walk them all the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I always, I do that, and then I call the, I usually call the, um, my counterpart in the vineyard after I visited and just talk to them, talk to them about what I've seen, talk to them about what might need to be done. But also I love to hear what are they seeing? What are they observing? What's, you know, just kind of thinking about what, what's this vintage all about? What am, what are the decisions? Anticipating decisions I'm going to be making for pick, um, for winemaking, for, for everything. I just really try to get a feel for, because winemaking is so much about feel, um, to get it, at least the way I make it, I'm not a lab. I'm not sending in numbers for phenolics. I don't pick like that. I, I do look at bricks when I'm looking at ripeness, but it hurts so much more about what do the vines look like? What signals do they show? What do the what do the grapes look like? What are the skins like? What are the what, what do things taste like? Are the seeds signify just all of the sensory impact? And I think that um, just walking through vineyards, the observations can can tell you so much. So. Yeah, I like to be involved. Sorry. <laughs> Do you think that your background, you know, studying medicine has made you sort of more detail oriented or more meticulous in that way than than most winemakers? Oh, I think that's just me. Um, I I think that's probably what led me to want to go into medicine. But yeah, I'm. Um, yeah, it's just me. I just like I love detail. I was actually talking to my husband uh, because my my son's school had Easter this past week, and I was supposed to I was supposed to be hosting it, but of course, we're homeschooling. There is no school, and so um, the other mom and I decided to make an activity bag. And my activity was making um, do your own Easter dyes. And so I was up until midnight chopping red cabbage beets <laughs> and like packaging turmeric and and and, and DJ. My husband came out and he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I'm making Easter bags for the class. And then I looked at him like, God, am I really, I'm crazy, aren't I? This is just, <laughs> it's like, I like to do things the hard way. You know, if I read something and it looks challenging, I'm like, oh, let's do it that way. That's awesome. <laughs> so yeah, it's just my personal. Do you hope that your son uh, follows in your footsteps and goes into wine or would you caution him against it? Oh, I, whatever, whatever he's passionate about, I want him to find something that he loves to do and that's fulfilling and that he can wake up every day and really enjoy. He comes down to the winery during harvest and he helps, he helps, he helps me do um, <laughs> punch downs and he helps with uh, grape sorting and I put him in bins to crush grapes. He loves tasting. <laughs> He's a delight, but yeah, no, I hope he does what he wants to do. So is there anywhere else in the world, if you could just wave a magic wand and make wine in another region, what would it be? Oh, so easy, champagne, so easy. I'm so with you there. <laughs> I would do a grower, I would be a grower champagne if I could come back in another life. There's so many though. I mean, Barolo, you know, love to be in Piedmonte. I think those vineyards are incredible. And, and then you think about all of the kind of more outskirts locations like Croatia or I, yeah, anywhere really, it's all good. But yeah, choice would be champagne. So um, during harvest, do you have um, like a particular uh, soundtrack that you listen to to keep you inspired and, and energized? Oh my gosh, um, it totally depends. <laughs> Uh, so at the winery where we make wine, they listen to The Bone, which is this uh, radio station in the Bay Area. Oh, yeah. that 1077. I was just listening to it in the car. <laughs> Play the same, you know, 60 song on a repeating loop. And, um, and so there gets to a point where I've been to the winery a lot where I cannot listen to classic rock because it's just a <laughs> kills me. So I would say instead of having things that I totally listen to, there are things that I can't listen to and that's that's what happens to me. But we 
through a lot of things, try to keep the mix up. I love having young interns because they bring music and I have a three-year-old who's turning four in a week and I listen to a lot of children's music. <laughs> I know all those songs. That's yeah. any variety, you know. Got it. So, so speaking of interns, is there, is there one task in the winery that you just hate that you make the interns do so you don't have to do it? Not really, not really. Our, we've got a really cool setup. I mean, it's me and I'm super hands-on. I have a cellar master and then we have an intern. And so it's this team of three and um, they're really involved. And I have so much happening during harvest and as you know, I care about details. And so I really depend on both the intern and my cellar master to be brains. I want them to tell me what they think, tell me what they see, tell me if something seems off. I, I, I want that interaction and I sort of, I approach it that for sure they're going to end up doing way more cleaning than I am, but, um, <laughs> because I just, my, I need to use my time to do other things, but I still clean. I clean tanks. I get inside tanks. I mean, I still do all of that. I guess if there's one thing that they might end up doing that I don't do, but I still end up doing it, it's cleaning the macro bins for picking. So, <laughs> I mean, I think That's you fair. have to be, you yeah. have to do everything how to do it well so yeah yeah so i'm going to pour it now so i'm having now the cabernet um 16 oh, nice. carte blanche so so um now that you mentioned you reminded me you work with pinot noir and chardonnay and you also work with sauvignon blanc as well right so <laughs> Is there anything that you don't do? I guess is my next question. <laughs> what other what other variety are you dying to work with that you haven't yet? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, probably Nebbiolo because those wines are so cool. I just don't know that there's any really magical Nebbiolo in California. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that would be that'd probably be it. Got it. And so, okay, I know you're drinking champagne tonight, but like walk me through like a normal night, you get home, you're with DJ, you're with your son, like you guys cooking up a storm, what are you opening? What's what's like a typical night in, in your house? Typical night, I get home um, and it's go time to try to make dinner in 30 to 45 minutes, which I've gotten really good at, but, um, but requires DJ taking Emerson outside and um and then i go outside i play with them a little bit they come inside we eat dinner and we always grab something um we always have wine on the table uh, my son loves champagne but he likes most wines um and we have dinner and uh talk about the day and um and then we usually finish dinner and play a game of charades or hide go seek <laughs> We work on building a plane or some other project with Emerson, and then it's bath time. And then I put him, I put him, DJ, my husband and I alternate putting him to bed. And then we we usually come back out and um, I, this is, you don't want to hear this, this is so boring. Uh, I do work, I come back out. And I, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I work, I, um, back before coronavirus, I would be doing like lunches, making nut butter, making these granola bars. So I make like snacks and food. I make bread. So I have some like cooking dinner, cooking and work balance that goes until 11 or midnight and then I go to bed. Really boring, you don't want to hear that. <laughs> you always have one. No. A peek into the life of Helen Kaplinger. That's, I think, inquiring why minds want to know. <laughs> it's fun. I mean, I love playing charades and hide and go seek and whatever else, digging holes in the backyard. Or we go out and we'll, you know, give, pull up a plant and feed it to the chickens or <laughs> grab something in the garden, harvest carrots or I don't know. The lights, I, it's light, light later now. So we usually go out and play in the garden a little bit too. 
Nice. Well, I remember also a big benefit of um, when I was your neighbor and, you know, cat sitting or chicken sitting for you was your garden, which is also so beautiful. You have such a green thumb, which is not a surprise, but um, I'm so glad you, <laughs> I'm so glad you joined us. Thank you for, for um, being here with me. And, you know, I know we're not, we're not sharing a glass face to face, but virtually um, I think, you know, it's, it, wine is still meant to, to bring us together and still can, you know, bring us together even when we're, we're, well, we're more than six feet right now, but uh, it's good just to see you again, <laughs> to raise a glass. And um, thank you so much, Helen. You're just a wealth of knowledge and um, it's been great sharing this time with you. So thank Likewise. you so much. And Everyone at home, thank you for, for joining, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. And we'll be back on Monday with Fritz Hatton. Have a great so. weekend, everyone, for having us. Bye, Helen. Thank you. Bye.